Welcome to the Connected Leadership Podcast, another live broadcast, and one I'm very excited to bring to you. So if you're in the UK and you're you're still inside at this point today, thank you for hanging around to join us and uh, say something in the chat, join us, say hello. Uh, the guest I have today is someone with a, an extraordinary track record in business uh, and two excellent books um, that he's he's put out there, as well as being a columnist for the Harvard Business Review. He's the former president and CEO of the Campbell Soup Company. He's the former president of Nabisco Foods. He's the former chairman of Avon Products as well. So uh, a man has been at the very highest levels of business. And we're going to be talking about uh, the concepts that he shared in two books. His book about touch points, uh, which very much goes uh, in line with a lot of what I share on the Connected Leadership podcast and in my own books, uh, and also his more recent work, which we'll be exploring as well. So um, Doug's new book is called The Blueprint, where he outlines six practical steps to lift your leadership to new heights. We're going to come on to that, um, but I'm going to start by looking at touch points, because if you've um, if you've listened to the podcast before, if you've worked with me before, you know how, how important touch points uh, are to me. And it's a theme that's come up a lot on the podcast recently as well, which is something that we'll explore. But first of all, I should welcome my guest, Doug Conan. Doug, thank you very much for joining me. It's great to be here. For the record, it's also a very sunny day here in, on Lake Michigan in the United States. So I'm inside with you also. <laughs> I'm not outside enjoying this beautiful weather either. Fantastic. Well, you've got the whole afternoon ahead of you. So when we finish, you can go and enjoy it. I'll, uh, I'll be making dinner <laughs> when we finish. But it's, it's worth it. It's great to, to have you join me, Doug. And as I say, if anyone is joining us live, say hello, uh, throw in your comments uh, and questions for us as well. Doug, as I've mentioned in the introduction, I, I, I really need to start by looking at touch points. In the book, you uh, encourage leaders to embrace interruptions. And I love that positioning because I, I, actually on a very recent podcast recording last week, I was talking about how for me personally, uh, I don't like being interrupted when I've got my head down and doing things. I'm very much a focused person. Um, but for you, it's a blessing. It's an opportunity. So why, you know, why should we see these interruptions as an opportunity rather than a challenge to our workflow? Uh, let me start off by just sharing the story of how my co-author and I met. My co-author is Meta Norgard, who ran the Covey uh, Leadership Center in Sundance, Utah, for an extended period of time. She's originally from Denmark, Denmark so she has a European perspective, mm. but has, uh, has brought that in a very healthy way to our work in America. But we were running a program in the bucolic setting of the, the mountains, uh, in Pennsylvania, taking some high potentials uh, through a, a four-day uh, program uh, when I was CEO of Campbell. And, uh, and you know, our rules there were phones down, we're just going to be focused on our work together and connecting. And uh, then at the end of the program, Meta and I went for a walk around the lake to debrief about the week. And, and, she, and she was reflecting on it, and she was saying, how can you go back to the office? Look at it. It's absolutely beautiful here. When you go back, the phone will keep ringing. People will be coming in and out. How do you get anything done? How can you look forward to going back into that Petri dish? And I said, well, you know, Meta, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as an opportunity to touch people and to and to connect with them and to help them move their work along and she was dumbfounded by that she's because she's a focuser and she wants to focus and she loves nature and and how can you do that and i i said that's the demand of the day uh look people are and that ultimately led to us writing the book touch points which is all about making powerful leadership connections in the very smallest of moments and my observation is that your contribution as a leader is largely determined by the 200 interactions you have in that day, which is large, which are largely two minutes or less. I mean, it's not you're sitting behind your 
desk and you've got this grand strategy that you're crafting for taking the organization to new heights. It's how it's how you're guiding the organization in all these brief interactions. And then we started doing the research and we found that people were being interrupted over a hundred times a day. And it's like, well, let's embrace the reality of that. And if we're going to be interrupted, let's get good at managing our time in smaller and smaller increments. And so at that point, we started to develop this philosophy that said, you know, there's a way to approach these small touch points that can make you highly effective and, uh, and more fulfilled. And so we created a model for it. And then we explored the development of it with others. And we found, you know, if you just go into these small interactions with an orientation, a mindset that says, how can I help? And then you, with our language, listen, frame, advance. And we created a simple little process, do it in 60 seconds. And then an exit uh, question of how did it go? And in those five little steps, you can optimize your impact in those small moments with people. And the beauty of the interruptions is that's when people are actually want to talk to you. If you're a leader and you want to talk to them, that's fine, but they may not want to be hearing from you and they're not going to be in the right frame of mind to engage. But when they come to you, it's fresh meat. They are there, they are there because they want input. And that's when you really need to be on because they're there to listen. And, uh, and so we started to develop this philosophy about powerful uh, impact in the smallest of moments. And it has it gained great traction uh, because everybody can relate to it. Everybody can relate to it. Now, you know, if you just go down the litany, you talk about uh, you, you go to work and uh, and then you see, you know, 100 emails in your inbox. And then while you're working on trying to catch up, you've got somebody stopping by to, uh, to ask a question because you didn't respond to the email from yesterday. And then the phone rings and do you have a minute to talk about this? And then as you pr plow through your day, you have, you, you're on your way to grab a bite to eat and somebody's standing outside your office saying, well, I know you haven't had a chance to get back to me, but I had this question. I, could we talk on the way to lunch? And then you get trapped at lunch and then you go back to your desk and you go through it all again. And then you go home and you go through the same things at home. Uh, life is one big giant series of interruptions. And so we help you become fluent in those interruptions. That's only one part of it though. The other part, and then we'll break is you have to be incredibly anchored in how you want to show up for people so that you can be fluent in those one minute interactions. Your foundation has to be rock solid. And so you have to do a little work to really nail, how do I want to show up for people? How can I show up authentically and effectively? And so we take you through a process to do that as well in touch points. So you figure out how you want to show up and then you become very fluent at showing up that way in smaller and smaller pieces of time. And that's the real world for most people that are working in large organizations. And what strikes me about it is it's very outward focused. Uh, I, I think that when we carve out, we block out space, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 read Cal Newport's deep work a couple of years ago and I block out time in my diary and that, that is when I'm writing that's when I'm focused but if we go overboard on that it's about us as a leader you're focusing on other people and you're 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 creating engagement for them uh, and I think one of the most important things you said there is the the point at which they want to interrupt you is when they're they're ripe they're ready for that conversation they're here they're ready so do you carve out any time for yourself i mean i'm assuming your phone's off for the next hour or so while we're chatting absolutely a part of building your foundation the uh, part of building your foundation is carving out time for reflection and study mm. but and that's great and that's very important i do it very early in the morning uh but then once you get into the or do it, performing for the enterprise, whatever that job is, uh, you're doing it with people. 
And my definition of leadership is, is the art and the science of influencing people in a specific direction. So if you want to have influence of people, it's important that you be well anchored on where you want to go, but it's also important that you be oriented towards influencing them in a highly effective way. And, uh, and in my experience, all of that influence typically comes through these very brief interactions. Uh, I think on my website, I'm quite sure on my website, I have, I just picked 10 one day. I picked 10 interactions that took less than a minute that I carry with me. Each one took less than a minute. I carry those lessons with me today. They were that profound. And they were from a correct collection of people, some who were mentors or people I really admired. One was from a woman my first day living in a new state in the United States, in Minnesota. And this woman greeted me. She was the first person I talked to in the state of Minnesota. And she made my day. And I remember that to this day. And I was thinking, wow, a complete stranger could have such an impact on, on a shy, reserved young man moving to a new state who doesn't know anybody. And look at how, what a difference she made in my day. And that's one of the 10. And, but they're all incredibly short. And, and I'm telling you, uh, what we encourage people to do is you, you ought to be uh, doing what they said here in the United States about Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player. When he was interviewed, they asked him why he was so effective. And he said, well, I skate to where the puck is going to be. I don't go to where it is. I go to where it's going to be. And as a leader, if you want to be highly effective, you have to skate to where the conversations are going to be. And they're going to be in these small increments. There, there's just it's, 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 it's patently obvious to everyone who's trying to operate in society today that it's sound bites, it's tweets, it's, it's sentences on LinkedIn. It's not long drawn out discussions contemplating the evolution of civilization in uh, unprecedented times of chaos. So uh, you have to be fluent in the moment. It's, it's interesting uh, that you say that because I think the discussion last week came around the new audio social app, uh, Clubhouse. And Clubhouse is based along on uh, conversations uh, on an app that can be an hour, can be two hours, three hours. And my point was I'm happy to engage with people over um, over LinkedIn with a couple of comments and so forth, but to put aside an hour here and an hour there and an hour there for engagement is a huge chunk out of someone's day. Um, so I, I tend to agree that if we can make an impact in a short period of time, um, you know, there's, there's space for those longer, deeper conversations, but it, 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 it's important to be able to do that. So let me ask you the question. How do you uh, make an impact in less than two minutes with someone? Well, the, the, it all starts with a mindset that says, I'm here to help. You have come to me. You are you have you have come to me. What do they say when the uh, student is ready? The teacher appears. Yeah. You have come to me to get some kind of feedback or on an idea. And so what I have found to be most effective is the first question is saying, how can I help? I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to own your idea. I want to help you move your initiative forward. So it's, it's bringing a servant leader mentality to this conversation saying, how can I help? And if I have if you if I have to make a decision, tell me. And then we have the in these brief interactions, we have three things we encourage you to do. Listen carefully. You know, because you know it's going to be short, so listen carefully. And and listen to what is said and to what is not said. Then you frame the question. You say, "Okay, I understand this is what you're asking of me, right?" And then listen, frame, and then advance. Most people want to get into solving the problem. We don't advocate that. There's no evidence that you can solve it. If it's that easy, they wouldn't be coming to ask you. So, so you, you just try and advance, help them advance their process. And then, and then, you, and then you say, okay, uh, good luck, and come back to me if you need to, but did that answer your question? 
And then as you leave, you ask yourself, you don't necessarily ask them, well, how did it go? How did I handle that? How can I do better next time? So how can I help? Listen for him in advance. And how can I do better next time? And I mean, if, if you sort of just approach it that way, it's amazing how productive you can be in two minutes. But if you allow yourself to be bogged down in some long protracted uh, conversation, what are all the alternatives? And have you thought about this, this, and this? You could be spending an hour. And maybe there's some things you should spend an hour on. But in my experience, most people aren't signing up for an hour of conversation with you. They're signing up for some input so they can advance their journey. You have to use your judgment there. You have to become, uh, again, I'll use the word fluent in this space of managing conversations with brevity, but knowing some of them have the potential to grow. But if you start out acknowledging that they're typically going to be short and you get good at the short ones, you can manage the longer ones. So talking about managing the longer ones, and, and it's, it's, I, I want to come back to this point about external focus, because I think that comes through in a lot of what you're saying. But first of all, I know this is going to be bugging someone somewhere, so I need to ask it. Um, when you talk about managing the longer conversations, there's always someone where you feel you've listened, you've advanced where they are, but they're, they're hanging on for more. How do you manage out of that conversation uh, without offending them or making them feel that they haven't got what they needed. So you're still making that impact. Well, you know, there's no uh, magic formula here, but what I have found is if the people with whom I work, which is most of the people that I'm going to be engaged in these conversations, the best way to manage it is before you engage in the conversation, you say, look, my goal, not in this conversation, uh, I have a process that I encourage leaders to do, I call it declaring yourself, first hour, first day you work with someone, put your cards on the table and share how you work. Uh, I, like most people, I've worked for people. I wasn't a CEO my whole life. I spent 30 years reporting to people who reported to people who reported to CEOs. And uh, I could have spent weeks wondering what exactly does he or she want from me? How should I be playing the game to get ahead? Well, I've blown all that up. I spend the first hour of the first day say, here's the game and here's the way I am. And I want to encourage you to come back and share with me kind of what works best for you. But first hour, first day, cards are on the table. And one of the things I talk about is most of our conversations are around specific things that are typically pretty short. And so, and I want to be helpful to you, but I also have obligations with lots of other people. So if it's not a planned activity that's scheduled. Just anticipate that it's going to be short and I'm going to help you advance it. And if we need to have another conversation, we can, if it's going to be a longer one, get on my schedule and I'm happy to accommodate that, but I have lots of people to talk to. And I can't compromise the next conversation that is already scheduled to honor this one, which was unscheduled. So what I have uh, now, I'm, I'm rushing through this, but I think I'm making the point. Yeah. The best time to 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 handle this is before you ever engage in it. So people know that, you know, I want to honor the people I'm supposed to meet with. And then I'm going to fill in as much as I can with all the interruptions and uh, and I manage it in a caring way. We talk about how important it is to to be uh, very caring in this approach. Uh, they have to know you you mean it. You want to be helpful, uh, and that's all in the book. But that's the idea. Tell before you get into it, let the people you work with, at least who are most of the interruptions, know. Here's how I try and approach it, and I'd encourage you to do it the same way. We can we can schedule a time to talk about that if you'd like. It, I mean, it, it sounds pretty clear. It's set expectations from the very beginning and communicate them clearly. Uh, and, and then people know, you know, when they approach you in an unscheduled way, exactly 
uh, how it's going to play out. So I said we'll come back to the external focus because I mentioned it in response to your first answer and then it came through even more clearly uh, in, in your second. You mentioned that your co-author had worked, I think, with, with Coffee Foundation and um, Coffee talked about active listening uh, and that's a clear part of your, of your process. Um, yes. I, I, I talk about the eye test uh, where when you're talking to people, count out how, up how many times you say I compared to you. Uh, and if there's too many eyes to use, then you're you're getting it very wrong. And it sounds like your approach is very similar. It's external focus. Take yourself out of the equation. Uh, and then people will feel that impact. And I'm assuming that's what happened to you in that earlier experience. In fact, your top 10 touch points, I wonder how many times that was the impact that you had was because people made it about you rather than about themselves. How, how does that play out in your general? Um, if you look at the relationships over the course of your career, where you think are the strongest relationships, and we'll talk about that in Thursday's podcast in more detail, but how important is it that people are focused on each other rather than themselves? Well, I I have a concept that we talk about in, uh, in both Touchpoints and the Blueprint that I, I believe in. And I, it's the concept is lead by listening, and uh, and uh, uh, people I have found that people who work for me and people I work for, once they feel heard, they 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 listen to me. But if they haven't felt heard, it's questionable how much listening they're doing. So I always try and collect data. Uh, from anybody I'm dealing with, whether they work for me or I work for them, asking, here's the issue, uh, and I'll share with you where I'm coming from, but what do you think? And uh, and I sort of soak it up to a point where, especially if it's a difficult situation and it affects them, they finally say, okay, I'm tired of you listening to me. Now, what do you think? You know, I, I want them to be feeling fully heard so that we can then get on to addressing it. Uh, and uh, I, I, the, the discipline of leading by listening is challenging because we tend to want to jump in and solve the problem. And we may have listened for one minute when we probably should have listened for three or five. And so uh, we encourage people to err on the side of listening too much and, uh, and to think of leadership as leading by listening and making sure you understand the context in which you're making a decision before you make the decision. It, it, it's, it's a small price to pay. Typically, you're only listening for another minute or two, but they feel fully heard. And then the impact I have found is dramatically uh, improved. Uh, because that extra minute or two of listening has set the table for a more constructive conversation. That's my belief. And I would share it. I mean, one of the things that I've picked up about myself over the last two or three years is uh, I'm a fixer. Uh, and that is that as soon as someone starts sharing with me, I want to find a solution for them. And it may not be what they actually want. And you talk there about people wanting to jump in and, 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 and fix it straight away. That's me to a T and one of the things I've had to learn to do and I'm still trying to master is uh, to just stop let people finish their sentence Andy let me tell you organizations are built to fix things organizations are critical thinking machines they are built to look at a spreadsheet and figure out what's wrong and go fix it that's the DNA of an organization and uh so the people that tend to excel in organizations tend to be fixers and tend to have that DNA. And so we find, I find, as I'm coaching them and helping them and mentoring them and developing them, that where we have to lean in typically is to the listening side to make sure you're fixing the right problem and you're doing it in a way that is going to be empowering of the people who actually own the problem, not you. And so it, it's a chronic issue. I don't care. I do work with, uh, with, with the government. 
with nonprofits, with uh, for-profit organizations, everybody's fixing. And, and so the, the most effective way to fix is to step back and really listen first, and then to empower the individual to fix the problem themselves so you're not owning it. And some of us like to own those things because I feel like I fixed something. There, I, I did it. I feel good about myself. And uh, it's not about you, it's about them. That's another piece of language that I use often. It has nothing to do with you. It has all to do, everything to do about them. And I think that's the case when, when, when it's me and I'm trying to fix, it's about making myself feel useful and making myself feel good because I haven't, I haven't spent enough time listening to work out what that person actually wants. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm not, as you say, I'm not the only one guilty of that. I, I'd like to, to move on. You, you've, um, you mentioned that you had 30 years or so working for other people. You've obviously had a long and successful career at the top of the, the pyramid as well. Um, over that time, the way we interact, the way we engage with people has shifted. And over the last 10, 15 years or so, at an increasingly rapid rate. How has the advent of social media uh, shifted the way that those interruptions come, the way that we engage with people, the way that we truly listen? How has it impacted on that uh, as you've seen it change over the course of your career? It's had a profound impact, but I don't know that it's well understood yet. Uh, I believe that it's going to take another generation of people living in a social media world to learn to be facile with, uh, with it in a way that can be much more productive. Uh, right now, we have... Uh, more coming at us with shorter and shorter uh, in, uh, in, in, fast, in, in, in more frequent intervals uh, and more stuff than ever before. And uh, it gets difficult to even give uh, the, uh, the person the two minutes it's you just read the tweet and you either like it or you want to comment on it or you move on to the next one. Uh, and, you know, I was never involved in social media until I retired about 10 years ago. And we started to build a platform that we don't promote much, but we're up to 400,000 people that every day we're talking about leadership. Uh, and uh, but, you know, you go in every day and there's this this rhythm to it that almost feels out of control. But uh, uh, I think uh, people are, haven't, haven't yet learned good discipline in terms of how they want to interact with, uh, with social media. And I think the biggest issue is what we, and we'll talk about it in probably a little later, in the blueprint, most people are, are interacting with all this stuff and they haven't done enough homework on themselves. And they're not really well anchored with what they think. They don't really have the courage of their convictions. They can't really express them well. And they don't have to in this medium. And, uh, and so the biggest challenge for aspiring leaders today, and I mean leaders of two or three people uh, or leading a family, is to do the homework and get really well anchored in your foundation so that you can be effective with all, with all that's coming at you. And, and that's where I feel like we're losing our way. I, you know, we, we used to have things that anchored our perspective in life. It could have been the church. It could have been our, our, our grandparents and our family, family values and, and the way we were raised. And that's sort of tearing away and not being, or certainly not being propagated as much as it once was. And so now that's what that's being filled with. It's being filled with tweets and comments and 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 podcasts uh, and all all other kinds of things coming at you from left, right, center. And so what what we have found, what I have found, is that people need to do a little homework and need to get in touch with what do you think? How do you want to walk in the world? Have you reflected on that? Have you looked at the world beyond the four walls of your life and said? What can I learn out there that will influence how I want to choose to walk in the world? 
and how I want to choose to engage in, as opposed to just pushing a like uh, uh, symbol on a screen. You know, it's we can do better and we owe it to each other. You, you talk so much about the importance of relationships. We owe it to each other to do better. You see, I view these relationships as a leader in particular. You're on sacred ground. You are having an influence on people's lives. They are thinking more about, in, in the work context, they're thinking more about their work. I mean, they wake up, they're thinking about what do I have to do today for work? They feed their children, maybe they walk the dog, and then they go to work, even if it's going into the bedroom next door to, to work remotely. And then they maybe take a break for lunch to see the kids or whatever. And then they go back to work and then they maybe take a, short, a quick break for dinner, make dinner, and then they take care of the kids and then they go back to their emails and they think about what do I have to do tomorrow? I mean, as a leader, you have a, a profound influence on their lives, more so than their families in many ways. And I think leaders and all people need to take these relationships much more seriously. And the first place to deal, to, to look is within. See, I think the only way out of this is by going in and really getting anchored in who you are and how you want to show it. You've obviously done the work. You have a point of view of here's where I'm coming from and here's how I want to walk in the world and here's how I want to influence people, you know? And I think that's where we all need to start. It took me until I was in my mid thirties to get to that point. There's a great quote by Brene Brown, and uh, Brene has this great quote. She said, you can either walk inside your story and own it, or you can walk outside of your story and hustle for your worthiness every day. And in my life, I was walking inside my parents' story, my friend's story for me, my coach's and teacher's story for me, my boss's story for me. But I wasn't walking inside of my story. I wasn't anchored in who I was and how I wanted to walk in the world. And it wasn't until I started to lean into that notion that I started to become profoundly more effective with others. And that's what I think is missing right now. I, I would agree with you. And I, I think it's a phenomenal point, very well made. Uh, the, you know, the question was about social media, but the point goes much broader but if we go back to social media I, sure. I, I look at you know the activity of some people on different platforms and I think there's no there's no indication here that this person has sat back and, sat back and really understood this is who I want to represent to the people I engage with on social media and they haven't done the work that you talk about in order to make that connection and if you've understood this is who I how I want the world to see me because this is who I believe I am, you can then look at the way you engage with people online and it can be more authentic and it will resonate with people more effectively. But you have to do the type of work that you've been talking about first. Well, ab absolutely. And, and, and the way I frame it in the blueprint is, look, uh, uh, we largely lead life by the seat of our pants. We react to what comes at us. We all do. And then we do the best we can in the moment. All right. But if you think about whatever you ex ever chosen to pursue to excel, if you wanted to be a, a, a great podcaster, you know, you worked at it and you studied it and you figured out how am I going to make this work? Right. So that I can maximize my impact. Uh, you worked at it. You treated it as a craft. It's almost like a mastery model. You apprentice at it when you started doing podcasts and you got better over time and you looked at who was really good and then you incorporated some of that and you got better over time. See, I think we all need to do that with our life journey. We need to sort of approach it with some intentionality and not do it all by the seat of our pants. The reality is, you know, I'm very intentional, but 75% of my day is reacting, but I'm anchored in what matters most to me and so that it guides how i react to everything that comes at me but i've spent the time to be anchored in what matters most stephen covey had a great line doug what matters most must never be at the mercy of what matters least and i found in my life and i find in social media 
that you can get sucked into the tit for tat stuff that matters least. It's not essential to who you are or what you want to do. And so what I encourage people to do is figure out what matters most and then be a little intentional with it, knowing that most of the time you're just going to be reacting because that's the way of the world and that's the way of social media. But have a point of view. You owe it to yourself. I love that um, that principle of being anchored. You spend your time reacting, but the anchor ensures that it guides your response when you react and, and it's not just um, freewheeling everywhere. So part of that, you've mentioned the blueprint. Um, you've got a six, step, a six step process in there, which uh, I guess helps you develop that anchor. So can you just share what the, the steps are and tell us a bit more about the book? I mean, let's just tell you briefly. When we did touch points, there were two things. You had to build a foundation and then you had to become fluent in the moment. We found everybody was really attracted to become fluent in the moment, but people weren't doing the work to build their foundation. So what the blueprint is, is going back to, here's the foundation you need to build so you can be effective in the world. And we need to tailor it to meet your needs in a world that's filled up. You have no time to work on getting better. There's no time. So the process we had to create had to nest perfectly in your cockamamie life. What, uh, you know, you had to be able to pursue this in a way that worked for you in the middle of the rhythm of your crazy day. And that was the process we set up. And, and, and we actually worked on it and uh, came up with these six steps, which is they're very straightforward and you get to a lot of the conversation we had separately. The first one is figure out where do you want to go and what's the kind of person you want to be and know that whatever you initially say will be wrong. But it'll be 80% right, and it'll start you on the journey. Then the step two is reflect. Reflect on all your life experiences. And, and, and harvest the learnings from there. We tend to move on and get worried about what's next. And there's a ton of learning based on our life experiences. The people we've known, the experiences we've had. We take you through a process to very quickly get to your top 10 experiences. And then the third step is to study. Look at the world around you beyond the four wheel walls of your life and say, what intrigues me there? I'm not gonna go study the world, but there's some people that fascinate me that I spark to. Why do I spark to them? And study the world very surgically. Don't weigh yourself down. And then the fourth step after you've envisioned, you've reflected, you've studied, is build a leadership plan. Build a plan for yourself and be very forgiving with it because whatever you build will be wrong, but it'll be a step in the right direction. And uh, it's so funny to me because I work with people in all these organizations and we have plans for everything. We have a plan for everything. But I, I ask someone, well, what's your leadership plan? Well, I don't have a plan for that. And this is the most important thing you're doing. And you have no idea. You're doing it by the seat of your pants. You can do better. And, uh, and you owe it to yourself to do better. And you owe it to yourself. So we help them develop a simple, what, what I call a leadership model, which is how I want to walk in the world, knowing it will be wrong, but it'll be 80% right. The next step is, well, that's great. We've done all this conceptual mumbo jumbo. But how are you going to show up? Because it's how you show up that brings that to life. So far, we just have a lot of intentions. What's your, what specific things are you going to do that bring your leadership model to life that signal to people that I'm showing up in a way that's committed to greater authenticity and effectiveness? And we help you develop practices where you just show up properly uh, in a way that is aligned with the way you want to show up. For me, a simple one is asking, how can I help? I learned that from a mentor. It affect, you know, you've heard me throughout this podcast talk about that. That's one of the first things I ask everybody is how can I help? And it frames, it starts to frame the way I approach my leadership for everyone. So their practices. And then the sixth step is, is a continuous improvement process. So it says, you know, I did all this and it's 80% right, but I know I can do better tomorrow than I did today. What small things can I do? And I go back through my six steps 
and, uh, and try and improve a little bit more tomorrow than I did today. I guess the last thought is it's built around tiny habits and incrementality. I've done a ton of work around creation of habits. J James Cleary's work has uh, been the most popularized and it's called Atomic Habits. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's done a lot of research here. And the things that are having the greatest impact are the things you can get your hands around. And uh, they're tiny habits that have big, make big differences. Sound familiar? That's the same thing as touch points. Yes, so, I was going to say. But we've got to get to a place where we show up the way we intend to show up, as we're being more intentional, a little less seat of the pants, and doing it with practices that bring our intentions to life so they're unmistakable with others. That process, you start iterating around, it's easy. And in two days, I've got a, a boot camp in, uh, in a couple weeks. We take people through two days of this process as they, they do pre-work ahead of time, and they're on their way. And they can do it in the car. They can do it when they wake up in the morning or before they go to bed at night. They can just iterate through that and say, well, what could I do better? And all of a sudden, they're on a path of continuous improvement that nests in their cockamamie life in, in a way that helps them show up in a more fulfilling way and also more effectively. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and I, I would I would encourage you to. You know, I, it's refreshing to me um, to hear you talk about people who, are, who don't have a plan for their leadership and are going by the seat of their pants, because this is my argument with professional relationships as well. These things are the most important um, elements of our success, but they're not the yeah. most fashionable. And they're the ones that we think, well, I'm naturally good at that. And, and there are there are leaders who are naturally good at leadership or relationships. But I would always argue that you talked about that 80% right. You could be 80% right at either of those things and very good. But what if you were 90% right? What if you'd put the work in and just built that, that marginal gain? Um, so... It, you know, it's putting that foundation in and you do the work up front through the book, through the boot camp, whatever it might be. Um, then it becomes those atomic habits. And, and uh, the challenges for a lot of people with these things is time. I don't yeah. have time to do that. But if yeah. you invest the time up front, I'm assuming it's the same with the blueprint. If you invest the time up front, the rest runs with the way you engage with people day to day. It's not a time consuming activity. Would that be the same? And the, the cool thing about the blueprint, this is my opinion, mm. uh, obviously, but the cool thing about the blueprint, it's not about me. It's all about you. It's, it's, it's your stuff. And you're doing with, you're, you're working with your stuff in a way that works for you, that helps you have a more fulfilling life. And we make it bite-sized and approachable because just like Atomic Habits, we know that learning requires uh, a, 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 a disciplined process that is not overly onerous and has diminishing returns. So we've 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 taken this and and made it approachable, uh, which you know you don't have to go to Harvard to get an MBA uh, or an executive go to an executive program to learn how to lead better. In fact, I would argue you probably won't learn how to lead better there. This is all about how you're going to show up in a way that works for you. And uh, and that's what the blueprint is written for. The only books that are, uh, I the book that had the most important influence on me was Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which was a, in the same vein, but not focused on leadership of what I do. And Bill George wrote a book called uh, True North. Uh, and uh, that book uh, had a profound influence on me too. And this is carrying it one degree further in the leadership space. Uh, and it's time tested. I, you know, we've worked with thousands of people at this point uh, through teaching and, and, and what have you. And uh, it works. It works. Well, on, on that note, Doug, um, we're going to talk more about the, the books that had an impact on you on our interview for Thursday's podcast. Um, but this has been fascinating for me. Uh, there's a, a couple of recurring themes throughout our, our discussion that I think are really important. One of them is about the bite size engagements and everything you know, that you're talking about. It, it doesn't have to be arduous. It doesn't have to be time consuming. It's about making a big impact on others or on yourself in a short period of time. 
and the other is the reflection. Uh, taking time reflecting understanding the impact you're making on others understanding who you want to be in the world and the impact you're having on yourself as well and all of that feeds great professional relationships so Doug we're going to carry on and talk about um, the role professional relationships have played in your career that will be on our Thursday podcast Uh, but for the meantime thank you very much happy to be here Great. Okay, so we'll go straight on to the Thursday one. Thank you very much for that, Doug. Um, our our Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube users are, as I thought, probably basking in the sunshine today. We've had Peter Stewart is watching on Facebook, um, remembering Campbell's Soup adverts, which made a big impression in the UK. I think um, it would be 80s or 90s, the, the big advertising campaigns over here. Um, but Peter's reminiscing at the moment, but uh, hopefully uh, gleaning a lot as well. If you are watching on LinkedIn, if you're you're listening on Facebook or watching on Facebook, you could be doing both. Um, please do jump in and and say hello. Ask any questions. Feel free. Uh, but Peter and I, uh, sorry, Peter and I, Doug and I are going to uh, crack on and and, and uh, record the second uh, podcast now, which will come out on the Thursday. So, Doug, the first question on that podcast is always the same. Um, Which professional relationships uh, have had the biggest impact on your career and and in what way? Well, I uh, uh, I've had I've I've had 28 bosses in my career. And if you count the person that that they worked for as a boss, too, because I was exposed to them, I've had uh, 56 bosses. Three were really good, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I, I I often think, well, why why were they so good for me? And uh, and my and and they they were uh, I'm not going to name names, but they were leaders who uh, who 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 were. Uh, dialed into my situation who understood the context that I was operating in and who genuinely wanted to see me succeed. And the more they wanted to see me succeed, the more I wanted to help them succeed. So I ultimately, based on those three people in particular, developed this philosophy that I carry with me today that uh, those three bosses that, uh, you know, it's, it just makes no sense to me. If you want people to value your agenda for the enterprise, you have to demonstrate that you value their agenda as a person. And those three people taught me that. And I've carried it with me everywhere. Okay, so that's the first, those three bosses I had. Then I've had a relationship uh, with a company, with Campbell Soup Company, where I developed a practice years ago of celebrating uh, contributions of employees because I had observed that they were big critical thinking machines in all these companies and that we were so busy finding out what was wrong. But even in the most broken company, eight out of 10 things were being done right and nobody was paying any attention to them. So I decided that I was gonna start celebrating things that were going right while we fixed everything that was going wrong. So at Campbell Soup Company, I started this practice of writing uh, 10 to 20 short notes a day, handwritten, to people who did something right that day. And they were contributions that were important to the company, uh, that had material impact, that were on strategy. They weren't gratuitous, I hope you've had a nice day kind of notes. Uh, but they were, they were saying to people that as a CEO, I was paying attention and that I appreciated their work. and you think peop- the people that work for me noticed that all their people were getting notes from me. And they said, oh, am I supposed to write notes? I said, no, but I do expect you to celebrate in a way that works for you, celebrate the contributions of people that are getting the job done while we fix everything. You gotta do both if you wanna be an effective leader. So I div- I did that. Well, it turned out later on i we did we added up all the notes and it turned out i'd sent over thirty thousand notes out and we only had twenty thousand employees over the decade i was ceo Mm -hmm. so wherever you went in the world including the uk we had offices in cambridge uh and king's lynn uh 
you would you'd see my handwritten note posted in their cubicle you know next to their family picture wherever you went and we were in 38 countries marketed in 125 countries around the world so fast forward i was in a near fatal car accident and uh i was lucky to survive i'm living proof you can put humpty dumpty back together again so uh but while i was in the hospital guess what we started getting notes all those people i'd written notes to and oftentimes i sent them to their home so when they opened it they would be with their family and share it with their family the appreciation it was overwhelming we would get buckets every day delivered to my hospital room of notes from employees wishing me well saying you were kind enough to wish me well and congratulate me six years ago i still have the note but i want to tell you you and your family are in our thoughts and prayers and it was i can't tell you it was so moving and it was so important for my family and myself for my wife and my children to feel as if this whole company had wrapped their arms around us and were helping us through this very difficult time so what i learned from that was how important yet again knew it already how important it is to make work personal uh uh nothing great ever was accomplished by people doing impersonal acts there was passion involved there was purpose there was a sense of personal commitment and so what i learned was to bring to make it personal and to bring bring the passion into the conversation you get that from me in these conversations we have so without, yeah so that's the lesson make it personal that was the other one without a doubt and i you know it's a it's a fantastic story it brings to mind we talked about stephen covey in in the last podcast it it, it brings to mind his his model of uh emotional bank accounts and oh, you, yeah. you just invest in and invest in it's something i share a lot and I also encourage people, you don't have to buy expensive gifts or give referral fees or whatever. A handwritten note has so much impact. And that's a wonderful story uh, to share just what that impact is. The, 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 the doctors and nurses must have thought that you were a celebrity uh, with, with the amount of, of mail that you were getting as well. Hey, let me tell you, I learned a lot from the doctors and nurses mm. related to touch points. When a nurse came in and was really tuned into my situation and they were uh they were saying how can i help they were listening framing advancing and as a, mm. we had a uh they had a big impact on me but if they were rushing because they had another issue at hand and and I, they were performing this task because they had to uh it, it didn't have the same impact and i my experience in hospitals and i had a lot uh uh was uh, it reinforced the importance of touch points and being fully present when you are with someone. Be uh, and whether you like it or not, you, you need to be fully present. So uh, that was my lesson. Yeah, it goes back, you know, I, I summed up two of the themes of, of the Monday podcast at the end. I, I missed out probably the biggest theme, which was that external focus we talked about a lot. And that's running through everything that you've shared so far just now it's yeah. all about that's where you make the impact if you focus on the other person and take yourself out of the equation uh it's absolutely key I, let me I, share with you one other uh, if i could i it, it, this isn't all perfect i've screwed up and uh i i remember being interviewed by a famous business fellow his name was lou gerstner he went on to be chairman ceo of ibm and uh I was hired by KKR to go into Nabisco right after it had become the world's largest LBO. A book was written about it, Barbarians at the Gate. I was hired to come in and help rebuild it. To help rebuild it. I was going into the smallest division of the thing. But it turned out I had an interview. I, I didn't know, but I, I was supposed to meet the chairman, Lou Gerstner, this larger than life character. And I thought it was just a meet and greet and welcome. Good to have you be on your way. And he came at me like, why should, why should we give you this job? You're not, you know, how do I, how do I know you're ready for this? 
And I was totally taken aback. And I was trying to be polite and encouraging and responsive to him. And the more polite I was and the more reserved I was, the more aggressive he was with me. And until I finally reached a point which about 20 minutes in, and I thought I was only going to be in there for three minutes, and I, which I finally got to the point where I lost it. And I said, well, Lou, it's obvious to me that you're not listening to what I'm saying, and you really don't know how the food industry operates. You know, it's it's is you know it's obvious. So if 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 the reason you want you should want to hire me is not obvious to you, then you shouldn't hire me. I don't need this job. And at which point he smiled and he said, "I was wondering how long it was going to take you to show <laughs> me the courage of your convictions." And I was too busy as I gave you the Brene quote, Brown quote earlier, I was too busy walking inside of somebody else's story, trying to make him happy and not standing up for myself. And I, I learned then that I had to show up. I had to have the courage of my convictions. And that was hard for me at times when I was climbing the ladder of success, wanting to please the people I was working for. And uh, I learned over time that it was important to have the courage of my convictions. It was also important to be able to share them in a way where the people I was sharing them with felt heard and respected in the process. But man, I screwed that one up. I almost didn't get the job and the rest of my career would have been very different. So you were in the process of screwing it up, but in the end you didn't because you, oh, you, you effectively geez. snapped. Yeah, I was, I felt like an idiot. I, I you know, and I've, I've, I've had other screw ups, but that one i felt like oh my god why did i just read that all wrong you know but ultimately i did show up and i was well anchored but man it was just by the <laughs> by happenstance yeah, I, I think it's very easy for people to fall into the same trap and i get asked a lot by people who are on the earlier stages of the leadership ladder how they network up so to speak you know how do i engage with the big bosses yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I think there is a balance between, you know, a senior leader does not want someone who's just giving them platitudes. They want to see your spark. They want to see your energy. They want to see your ideas. So how do you strike that balance? How do you push back and challenge where you need to while retaining the respect that a senior leader would command? Well, I think in, in relationships with senior leaders, I think, uh, well, uh, first of all, you have to build a strong foundation. You have to it's hard to have the courage of your convictions if you don't know what your convictions are. <laughs> and so you, you sort of got to get well anchored in what you want to stand for with senior leaders. You mm -hmm. feel sort of, you need that if you want to ultimately succeed. So you have to build a strong foundation. Then the other thing you have to do is with senior leaders, you have to listen first and you, you, you advance your relationship with them by listening first. And then by taking the foundational knowledge you've cultivated about yourself and sharing it in a very direct way that fits into the way they're viewing uh, a situation so that you're making it easy for them to connect with the real you because you've paid attention to where they're coming from. So you got to build a strong foundation and then you've got to you've got to be direct and and share a point of view, share your spark, but do it within the context of the way that leader is viewing the world at that point in time. And then you can always say, and that. So I think that's in response to your your question. But I view it another way, and here's the way I think about it. But where you always want to start is within the context created by the leader, and be responsive to that, and then be. Feel free to take it to another place, but first dial into where that person's coming from. I find that's true with everybody, but particularly with senior leaders. Uh, you have to dial into their reality first and then bring your reality to the party. And that goes back to something you said in our earlier podcast, the Monday podcast, that uh, people will listen to you, but they have to feel heard first. Uh, and, and it's, it's an extension of that, leaders. especially Respect. senior leaders. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to wrap up, to wrap up, uh, in our Monday podcast, you've already mentioned uh, a few books that have uh, really had an impact, like Atomic Habits, like the the Seven Habits as well. Um, 
which other books, podcasts, uh, or, or TED Talks, for example, uh, have really inspired you and you think are, are worthy of sharing? Well, uh, I would. There's another book uh, uh, by uh, Jim Collins, Good to Great, yeah, which created a framework for me to think about how I ran a company, uh, and uh, and and how I viewed leadership. He, uh, good to great, he, he talks about, you know, you need three things, disciplined people, disciplined thinking, disciplined action. And then he has a way of getting there. And I find that's true uh, uh, with people I work with. I need to get disciplined people. We need to create a, a thought process. And then we need to create a process that, that helps bring the, that thinking to life in the real world. And so that probably had the most profound impact on me. But there's another book uh, by a friend of mine, uh, Susan Cain, who wrote the book Quiet. Quiet. Yeah. She's the queen of introverts. Uh, she would, she, I, I shouldn't have said that because she would roll her eyes at me. But uh, I'm also an introvert. I was my whole time growing up. And uh, obviously I'm coming out of my shell, but we're in territory that I'm very comfortable in. Uh, and I was always having trouble breaking out of my introversion I felt like to be a leader, you had to be an extrovert. And it was, and it felt like foreign territory for me. And so I was an introvert trying to be an extrovert in order to be an effective leader, but I wasn't being authentic. So uh, Susan helped me sort of navigate all that. And, uh, and so the book Quiet had a profound influence on me. And Brene Brown's writing on vulnerability, her, you know, uh, Dare to Lead uh, was very important, too, because when I look at it, when I, the leaders I most admire, they all have a degree of vulnerability that is, uh, for me, I spark to that. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a fan of Gandhi. I'm a fan of Mother Teresa. Uh, you know, I, I, I have... Uh, all kinds of leaders in my, what I call my entourage of excellence, uh, people that have had a profound influence on me, who have strong points of view, but are very comfortable being vulnerable about things that they're not certain of. And what I find is uh, that I learn more that way. So uh, the other book that I would highlight would be Brene Brown. There's one podcast uh, or one uh, TED talk that, uh, uh, that, uh, oh God, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, the title of the podcast, podcast or the TED Talk is Should You Live for Your Resume or, or Your Eulogy? David Brooks from the New York Times. And, and David Brooks gets into this conversation about, uh, you know, we get seduced into living uh, for our resume, but in the end, we, we need to consider what our, the eulogy is. And, uh, and he said, and he challenges us to wrestle with that and to live a life that is honoring our desired eulogy while we're building our resume. And uh, I found that to be, I commend that to people. It's five minutes. It's worth watching because he's, he's a wise man. He's a thoughtful man. And uh, he's written a whole book on it now. Uh, it's called the uh, the Second Mountain or something. But uh, the, te the the TED Talk is 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 I highly recommend it. It's uh, those are the kind of questions we need to wrestle with to really build our foundation. Uh, we need to go deep, not so deep that we get lost and can't find our way out, but we need to go deep enough so that we're really pretty well grounded in, in how we want to show up so those are the books that i mean th three great books i don't know the ted talk but it sounds fascinating i've uh i used to run a a breakout exercise in a workshop where i asked people what do you want people to say to you say about you at your memorial service or your funeral you um, uh, and it's very much on the similar vein and it's fascinating seeing people's response to the question 
uh, because we're so engrossed in the moment and we don't think about it. This goes back to a lot of what we talked about in the earlier podcast, uh, thinking about what we want to represent, stand for, and that's what the eulogy is. So I'll be checking that TED Talk out. Three excellent books as well. Uh, Doug, do hang on um, for a quick chat, but for the moment for, to say thank you for the podcast and thank you to everyone who joined uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I really appreciate you joining me.